Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. There's a new audio book that just hit stores. It challenges readers to take ownership of their lives and become what they respect. This is called The Warrior Within. The author is Nitke's dad. And the author, Doug, is right here with me now. We're going to talk all about it. Doug, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for the opportunity. The pleasure is all mine. Doug, what can readers, listeners, expect whenever they listen to The Warrior Within? Probably depending on what they're looking for. I mean, there's a lot of things that we say what we want, but very few people know what they need. So what they'll likely take away from this is understanding that what we want may not necessarily be what we need in order to grow and be happy in life. I mean, the purpose in life is to live it, not merely exist in it. And that's easier said than done for a lot of people. It's a struggle for some, it's harder for others, but it's really about a mindset. And ultimately, it comes down to when you look at the reflection you see in the mirror, can you be honest with what you see? I'm not asking anybody to be perfect and to look for perfection, but if you've got faults or failures, or if you've got things you want to change about yourself, the first place you've got to look at is that reflection and decide for yourself, I need to change this. And then it's a struggle, or if it's how do I go about doing it? And moving along that path that leads you down to changing your life. And that's hopefully where they start at. And it could be anything from their physical appearance, their weight, anything along those lines to how they react or respond to a family member or a friend who's just toxic and they don't know how to break free of it. Or even delving into the the craziness of politicians or politics when you hear these individuals, these talking heads that only want to basically rile up your emotions and then ask for a campaign donation when they're really not interested in solving the problems. They're just in a perpetual campaign cycle. So a lot of these things, they don't really serve your purpose, but the choice is yours and how you respond and how you move forward is up to you. Doug, what sparked you to write this book? What inspired you to say, hey, I got to sit down and start writing? Ultimately, it was a Swedish singer by the name of Molly Sandian. I had seen a YouTube video of her in early January 2021, and this is when the height of the pandemic is going on, and her physical beauty and her voice just captured me. And then I started to notice subtle things changing the universe. I was getting more focused. I was actually starting to work out. I was starting to take care of things around my house, cleaning it up, you know, get rid of all that stuff in the medicine chest that expired. And then I had seen her performance on the Oscars a couple months later in the city of Husavik, Iceland. The northern lights were in the background, and it's something I've always wanted to see. And that just blew me away. And I'm like, okay, two days later, three days later, she was interviewing or being interviewed about owning her own story. And I couldn't understand what she was saying. She was talking in Swedish. The interview was in Swedish. But I could tell there was a strength and integrity about her. And it was at that moment I started... I need to write my own story. And I initially started doing this from the perspective of I didn't want to go into the detail, the emotional level detail with a potential significant other, but I did want them to know everything. So that's why I started writing what the inspiration was to write my own story. When I decided to publish it, it was after sharing some of these stories with strangers as I was doing Uber or just meeting people on the street and we were having conversations. And there was a connection and several people had said, you need to write a book. Mm. So when I finally heard that, it sunk in and I'm like, okay, I had already been writing for a while. Let me go ahead and look at publishing this. And I did that a couple months later, what it would take to publish it. So you had published before this. Would you call yourself a seasoned author then? Oh, God, no, I had never published before. This was my first outing. And it was still a little bit scary because I'm still learning as I go. What was it like listening to The Warrior Within as opposed to reading it? I was actually impressed with the the individual that I had selected to do the audio because the inflections that he had, the emotions, everything about it was exactly what I felt when I was writing it. Hmm. Well, I love the message of this book. It's titled The Warrior Within, 
It's written by Nitke's dad, and of course the audiobook version is published by the Audiobook Network, and you can find it everywhere, so get on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store, or go to Amazon, any place that you find your audiobooks, and you'll be able to pick this up. Doug, thank you so much again for joining me here and telling me all about this. I had a nice time talking with you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity again. This is the story of the world's smallest monkey in Mr. Tony's Circus. This is titled The Adventures of PJ Jr. It's written by Rita Moser. We get to talk all about this book. Rita is right here with me now. Rita, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Can you tell me what readers will expect here, Rita, when they open up The Adventures of PJ Jr.? Well, I'm hoping that they're going to be so surprised about all of the illustrations. I'm hoping that they'll want to ask many questions and they will want to know more about PJ, that they will be amazed at how small he is, and that they will appreciate how he feels about being lost from his circus. And then also that they will be excited about the stories that he has to tell and the new friends that he makes. Rita, can you tell me about the illustrations? I saw the cover and it's beautiful. Thank you very much. The illustrations I wanted to make as close to nature as I could. And then I wanted to get the view of maybe what a bug would feel like if it was in the forest. And I wanted the little character that I used to be more like my children more. I wrote this actually 30 years ago when my children were very small. I had four and they were ages 3 to 11. And so I tried to write the book to make each of them ask questions and be interested in the book. And so the illustrations, I have been told by people that have read it, their children did ask a lot of questions as they looked at the illustrations. So I just tried to make it as real as possible, yet very imaginative at the same time. And it just being a role that people don't normally get to experience, but yet they would like to be a part of as they go out in nature. Hmm. So you wrote this a long time ago, Rita. What made you decide that this needed to be published now? Well, a long time ago, it was very hard, you know, 30 years ago, to find an agent Mm. to get a publishing company. And so what I did was I just saved it. In fact, I put it on a shelf and forgot about it. I sent it to several, and they wanted it to be more to an age, a particular age. And because I had the four children, I wanted to give it to them. And so I just decided to save my book because it was written for my children. And fortunately, in this day and age and with the Internet, giving it to them has become available because you can find a publisher that appreciates all kinds of stories. And so I had my children. They're now grown. They have children of their own. I have eight grandchildren now. And they were ready for me to publish it so that the grandchildren would have it. And so I found Christian Faith Publishing. So I sent it to them, and they liked it. They said that they felt with the Internet and all the people that it reaches that I would find a variety of people who appreciated that it was not for a particular age group. So I had it published, and I have had several adults tell me that they enjoy reading it as much as their children. I can only imagine that day, Rita, when you finally got your first copy in, and you got to hold The Adventures of PJ Jr. for the first time. What was that like? Oh, it was so exciting, and I really couldn't believe it. And I had one of my granddaughters here at the house at the time, and she was so proud. And she got my cell phone, and she was ready to make a video right then and there to show other people. And it was. It was just so exciting. There isn't anyone that I hand the book to that when they see the cover, they are very impressed. And they're like, wow, you really are. You're an author. You're an artist. And I'm just very proud of it. And I feel like Christian Faith Publishing did such quality work for my book. The pictures are just like the ones I actually drew. It's just such quality. They were so good transcribing the book for me and then editing it. It was a very easy process and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I'm actually in the process of coming out with a second book. Hmm. And I'm working on a third book. So Christian Faith Publishing has my second book right now. It should be out in a couple of months. We're just beginning the editing part. It has been transcribed. It will be about my mosaic work in which Peanut is actually at my house seeing my mosaic artwork. And then the third book will connect the first two, and we will be on our way to having many adventures with PJ Jr. 
Oh, what a wonderful book. This is titled The Adventures of PJ Jr. It's written by Rita Moser, published by Christian Faith Publishing, and you can get it everywhere. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, your traditional brick-and-mortar stores, all these places will have this book. Rita, thanks again for coming on the show and telling me all about PJ Jr. and what you have coming up next. I enjoyed our time. Thank you so very much for having me, and you have a good day. I would like to welcome back to the Reader House Author Roundtable, Randall J. Ruska. Randall, welcome. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you for asking. It's very exciting. The audiobook version of Epiphany Through Songs just came out. So what can readers and listeners expect whenever they listen to this book? Well, hopefully they can enjoy some music and relate spiritually to some of the insights that I've had writing the book and going through life. So that's what I'm hoping for, a spiritual and educational experience. Hmm. Randall, what kinds of readers were you speaking to with this book? Well, I'm trying to cover a large age group, you know, from uh, teenagers to I'm 70 years old and older, so I have music covering quite a, about a 50-year time span and from different genres, so hopefully I'm trying to appeal to a wide audience. Hmm. And before Epiphany Through Songs, had you ever published before this? No, this is my first published book. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, I really have no background in publishing or music or education or degrees or I can't sing a tune and I don't play a musical instrument. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Randall, can you tell me, how have the experiences in your life affected what you've written here? Well, most of the songs, I've had an emotional, spiritual experience with it, and that's why I chose these songs uh, covering from my teenage years right up to about 10 years ago. So the songs have touched me uh, emotionally and spiritually. Hmm. And can you tell me about how you wrote this book? What was your method for writing it? Well, there are songs that I've said that were a part of my life, and when I heard these songs, why well, I listened to them, and I was kind of open to the spirit and what was going to come forward, and I got some inspiration, and after the inspiration, I started writing down the lyrics and then trying to back up some of my spiritual thoughts by scripture passages from the Old and New Testament. Randall, did it take a long time to get the audiobook version of this produced? It's about six months. I guess I had to have it published first, and then it was about a six-month process to get the audio part finished. Hmm. And considering everything that you've learned along the way of doing this, do you have any advice that you could offer to authors who are just starting out? Well, I would just stick with the task. You're going to run through some dry spells, and you're going to run through some discouragement, but just hang in there and don't force the issues and let it flow, and it'll come to you. Just stick with it. Oh, good advice. Looking down the road, Randall, do you see yourself maybe publishing more books? A possibility. I don't have anything planned, but I might do something, something down the road, yes. Hmm. What would you do differently next time, Randall? Was there something along the way that you think you would change up? No, I, I still plan to be using music and been a part of my life and it's been inspirational and probably use the same format and try to back up some of my insights with scripture passages. Hmm. Randall, what person would you say has most inspired you to write this book? Well, the person that most inspired me would have been the uh, Father Richard Rohr, the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Although he never encouraged me to write a book, a lot of the insights that I have came from a lot of his works and writings. Hmm. Well, I think a lot of readers and listeners will be blessed by this book. It's called Epiphany Through Songs. It's written by Randall J. Hruska, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. Take a look on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or on Amazon, anywhere that you go for your audiobooks, and you'll find this book. Randall, it's been wonderful speaking with you again and learning all about your work. I had a nice time talking today. Thank you. I appreciate it and enjoyed it. The Adventures of Layla, the Lovable Dog, the Story of Going to Doggy Training Classes, Book 2. Well, that's the new book. It's in stores now. It's written by Stacy A. Delaney, 
And I'm really happy we get to talk all about this book. Stacy is right here with me now. Stacy, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time, Stacy. What can readers expect when they open up The Adventures of Layla, the Lovable Dog? Well, they can expect a beautiful dog who has inspired me to write this book and never owning a dog before. They can be inspired by what they could do if they adopt, purchase, or get a dog and what to do about it when the dog doesn't behave so well. <laughs> and it's not really the dog's fault. Stacy, where did you get the idea to write this book and this series? What sparked you to sit down and say, hey, I got to write these? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask that because I thought about what inspired me. And the fact is, Layla is truly a lovable dog. And she did inspire me. But really, what inspired me is my love and passion for reading. I have worked with children my entire life in the field of education. And it really was always a lifelong dream after reading so many books to children to be able to write my own book and share that with other children, especially my grandchildren. Stacy, how long of a process is it for you once you sit down, start writing one of these stories, and clear up until it goes through the publishing process and hits stores? It's hard to put into hours how long because I get ideas that pop into my head, and then I kind of write those ideas down, and you know, then I draw an outline of those ideas, and then I write the story out, believe it or not, by hand hmm. first. I always have to just, I don't know, there's something about that tactile experience, that kinesthetic experience of having that pencil in my hand and just get to writing it. And then, you know, once I do that, then I put it into a Word document on the computer and tweak it then and see how it looks and such. So that's kind of really the process that I use. And then once that physical copy finally comes in and you get to hold the product of all that work, Stacy, what's that like? Oh, my gosh. That is such an incredible feeling. <laughs> when I got that book in my hand, it was just, like, unbelievable. I did this. You know, I'm thinking, I did this, and I'm so grateful to God. Because really, if I didn't have, I believe, my faith that I just would not have the courage to have done this. So, but it was, it was just an incredible experience. I got to share it with my husband who, you know, has stood by me in this whole process and it's really exciting. This is book two in the series. And I understand this isn't the end of the series. Oh, it is not because book one was really about the rescue of Layla because we rescued Layla from very upsetting circumstances, but really the twist is Layla rescued us. And Layla rescued me, especially, you know, having gone through an emptiness and my dad passing away, it was just, you know, a heart that was hurting. And Layla just came into my life at the right time. So that was the first book. And then this, of course, and then of course, okay, what do I do with a dog once I got her? I was like, okay, I have no idea. <laughs> so that's when I got the inspiration to like, well, okay, I need to take her to doggy training classes. And then book three, because it is a series, book three is in the wing as we speak. And I'm very excited about that because Layla goes to school in that one. And Layla really did come to school with me when I was a high school principal. And she was a great joy and comfort to students, especially when, you know, things happened, you know, unfortunate things that happened. And she was just, she was just always lovable and brought so much joy. And that really, that's behind the inspiration. I know so many readers are going to be blessed by this book. The title is The Adventures of Layla, the Lovable Dog, the story of going to doggy training classes, book two. This is written by Stacey A. Delaney and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. And you can pick it up everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Stacy, it's been wonderful talking with you tonight. I had a really nice time. Thank you for joining me. And thank you, Corey, for having me. I really appreciate it. And I just hope people go out or go online and buy this book because it is truly adorable. 
I'm holding a book now that's a continuation of the Morning After series by Jason B. Cruz. This one's titled The Enemy Within. We're going to talk all about this book. The author, Jason, is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Jason, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. How are you doing today? I'm doing great now that we're talking about this book. Jason, can you tell us about the series and about what's in this book, The Morning After, The Enemy Within? Yeah, basically, it's about aliens, an uh, interstellar alliance of alien worlds, and that the human race, Earth, was a part of this alliance a long time ago. A virus broke out, and they created a zombie outbreak at herd, destroyed almost the entire Earth. They evacuated it. Fast forward it to today, they uh, ended up having it came to Earth, set up a base, and then the main character found a bunch of uh, survivors, brought them back. And that's basically the summarization for the, the first book. The second book kind of takes up where it left off, where they go into death and how the, the virus came to be. It was found out that the humans from 250,000 years ago accidentally created the virus, got released. And now rogue members of the Alliance want to take that virus and weaponize it. They purposely infected the human population to try to hide their track, you know, to hide what they were doing. And the main character discovers this, goes, finds the bad guy. There's a big war that ensues. And in the end, we'll find out what goes on. But that's basically it in the short term. (laughs) Wow. I I love everything that you have at play here. So we have aliens, we have zombies, we got viruses, and the aliens are billions of years old. So, Jason, you got to tell me, how'd you come up with this idea? Well, I like zombie movies. I've been in sci-fi horror for a long time. Growing up, I used to watch every single horror movie, sci-fi movie, mm. went out, collect comic books, read all everything on that. I travel a lot. I've been to many different places. I've met a lot of different people. And it just kind of all kind of came together. And it's like, yeah, let's see what we can do. Oh, I love it. Is this your first book? I know this is actually the second in the series, but is this your first time writing? Well, no, I actually have been writing for, well, I have written but never was published until these two books. Mm. I've written short, tried to write short stories. I'm not really good at writing short stories. Every time I try to write a short story, it ends up turning to be about 100,000 to 200,000 words. (laughs) (laughs) So I still have not written a successful short story because it always seems to come out to be a book. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I usually have to cut these things down about 250,000 words from when I'm done. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just keep writing. Mm. And I understand The Enemy Within isn't the end of this series. There are more to come. Yes, yes. I have a, a third one I'm in the process of writing. Plus, I also have a couple of other properties that I'm working on, too different genres and stuff like that. Mostly science fiction horror, but, you know, different kind of stuff. How long does a book like The Enemy Within take you to write, Jason? The first one took me, I'm going to say, maybe two years. I wasn't working on it all the time. I I actually really, I actually still have a normal nine-to-five job. So I kind of did it when I had time and all that stuff. The, The second one actually took me a year. Not even that. If COVID didn't come around and all that stuff, I would have probably had it done in about six or seven months. The second one was actually very much easier to write than the first one, since I kind of already had the base idea of what was going to happen from the first one, because it's, it's literally a continuation. It's a year after the first book, but you know, going into the character development, which I already kind of had, I just fleshed out the characters a lot more, bringing some growth and some change to each of the characters mm-hmm. and kind of... I focused on certain characters more than in the first book because it was like a whole group of people trying to survive, trying to get back to the outpost. Well, this one, they're already there. Now they're just trying to go out and save as many human lives as possible. I think readers are really going to love this book and this whole series. This, of course, is part of the Morning After series. It's titled The Enemy Within. It's written by Jason B. Cruz. It's published by Newman Springs Publishing. It's available everywhere, so go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or walk down the street to your local bookshop and you'll find this book. Jason, again, thank you for coming on the show and tell me all about your really creative work here. I really enjoyed our time. Yeah, me too. Thank you. This book encourages readers to seek God and His purpose for their lives. It's titled, 
Church and Compromise, and the author, Bishop Jeffrey E. Battle Sr., is right here with me now, and we're going to talk all about this book. Bishop Jeffrey, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. The pleasure's all mine. Uh, Bishop, what can readers expect when they open up Church and Compromise? Well, what they can expect is to be able to be led down a direction that actually is what I call the truth of God versus some of the compromise conversation and compromise teachings that's going on. And so this brings it back. You'll get a load of what the scripture says instead of what a lot that man says. Bishop, what inspired you to sit down and start this book? What sparked you to do it? Well, I was looking one day reading my Bible and ran across Ezekiel 22 and 30. And that verse says that, you know, it says, so I sought, you know, for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. And that always told me that God has continued to look for someone to stand in the gap and continue to see things going on. He wants somebody to step up and say something. So that provoked me to be that person. Mm. And how long did it take you then to get this written and then put it through all those publishing hoops? It was about two years. What did you find the most challenging part about the whole thing? Most of it was, for me, my way of writing it, I would record what was in my mind and when I would read and I would record myself and then I would have my wife transcribe the notes and then I would go back and I would continue to confirm it with the scripture to make sure that I wasn't giving a lot of my opinion, but I was giving what the word said. Hmm. And when it comes to writing and publishing, Bishop, have you ever done anything like this before? No, this was my first one. Wow. Well, congratulations. It's such a big deal. You know, so many people say, yeah, someday I'm going to write a book. Most of them don't. <laughs> so that, that's great that you put it out there and you got it done. What was it like when that first copy came in the mail and you got to hold this physical thing for the first time? Man, you know, I was, you know, excited because, you know, it was something finally that I felt I completed that God wanted me to do because I think we spend the majority of our lives, if you, you know, if you're Christian and you're believing in God, that we spend most of our time putting our request out to Him. Mm -hmm. And so it's finally I felt like I did something from Him and I had proof of it in my hand. Looking down the road, Bishop, do you see yourself writing and publishing more? Oh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm working on another one now. Oh, fantastic. Is it a kind of continuation of Church and Compromise, or are you exploring other things? No, it is a, it's a continuation, and actually uh, the continuation of it, it, it goes off of the last chapter in the book. And when I was writing, I came to that point where I got down to it, and I thought about, you know what, I want to pick up right from here. Because I felt like I had said everything that I needed to say, but it was just taking me somewhere. And so now I've gotten to that place where, you know, I see where it's taking me. So I'm going to write, be able to come up and write the next one. And I'm going to, you know, have it, it's going to be the title. The last chapter of this one will be the title of the next book. So many people listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out. So based on what you've learned doing this, Bishop, do you have any advice that you could tell them? Yeah, I would just say to really, if whatever is your passion that you have in you, the desire that you have, trust it when you start putting it on paper and not leave it subject to somebody else's opinion or change. It's the reason that it's put in you, and you should feel very comfortable and confident with sharing what you have in yourself. Being your first book, what's the most rewarding aspect now for you of being a published author, Bishop? Well, it's that, that I realized that I have established a platform and an accomplishment that I can be able to share these things, you know, that's very near and dear to my heart. Of course, this is the audio book. I think listeners, readers will be very encouraged when they pick it up. It's titled Church and Compromise. It's written by Bishop Jeffrey E. Battle, Sr., and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So get it on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, everywhere you go for your audiobooks. Bishop, thank you again for joining me and telling me all about your work. I had a really nice time talking tonight. Thank you so much, and the pleasure's all mine. Stop being a victim. Lift weights off, lift eyes up, and spread your wings. Now, those aren't my words. That's the new book by Diana Baronic, and we're going to talk all about it. Diana is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Diana, thank you so much for joining me tonight. 
Yes, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to this. Well, I've been looking forward to finding out about this book. Can you tell me what readers are in store for here? Sure. This book is my personal memoir, and it's how God really transformed me, got me to the other side of a victim mentality. I take readers through a lot of the traumas and trials that I experienced throughout my life and how to not be defeated by any of it. Mm to get to the other side of adversity, not as a survivor or a victim, but as an overcomer. And I use a lot of quotes and Bible scripture verses, as well as tips for readers, various things that helped me overcome the victim mentality. And I look very much forward to sharing these things with readers, because I think it's very important to be an overcomer in life. That's the way to do life. You're absolutely right. That's very important, Diana. Now, when you were writing this, were you speaking toward a certain group of people? No, not really. I mean, I guess throughout my life, you know, not only my story, but I would see other people being a victim of something, you know, Mm. basically staying stuck in a chapter of your life and not moving on, not turning the page. And it just really hit me that, you know, a lot of people like me don't know how to get to the other side. You know, you get hit by many things in life and things seem unfair and you just don't know how sometimes. So I think it's really for anyone to learn. And that was, you know, the basis for my book is there's a lot of wisdom that I would like to impart to other people, you know, of any age, anywhere in life. Hmm. Diana, what sparked you to sit down and start writing this book? What inspired you? Writing a book wasn't on a to-do list. It wasn't ever a dream of mine. So me actually sitting down to write was a very God-inspired process. Hmm. It basically happened in the fall of 2021, one evening, I had listened to a writing crash course, and a number of events kind of came together of a positive nature. And I just really felt like God, the Holy Spirit, was speaking to me to not be a victim of writing, to not be a victim of chapters that haven't happened yet or where I didn't have closure yet in my life. He just basically said to me, do it now. Start writing despite not having answers, despite issues still remaining. Stop being a victim of singlehood. And literally when these events just came together, just little things, and just like this voice talking to me, I started writing immediately the next day. And it just all gelled that I was supposed to do it. Mm. I felt I was ready which to me meant being raw and vulnerable and writing for the right reason. What was the purpose behind me writing? Because I feel we all have a story and my story is very raw and vulnerable. It's going to be out there. And, you know, how do I want to share this? I have to be ready to actually put this out there. But my purpose was to help other people, not go through the long version of getting to the other (laughs) side, but maybe some shortcuts, more wisdom along the way, that type of thing. I think an awful lot of readers are going to find help. They're going to find hope in the pages of this book. It's titled, Stop Being a Victim, Lift Weights Off, Lift Eyes Up, and Spread Your Wings. This is written by Diana Baronic and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. And you can grab it up anywhere. So head on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or your local bookshop and you'll be able to get this. Diana, thank you again for joining me and telling me all about your story and about your work. I hope we can do this again soon. Yes, I would be looking forward to that very much. And the book also will be coming out as an audio book within the next few weeks. I'm excited for that also. I'm really happy to be sitting with author Elizabeth Jimenez here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for having me. 
Very exciting. You have a new book out. It's titled, Jesus, When I Did Not Know You, But You Knew Me, and When We Both Knew Each Other. I love the title of this book, Elizabeth. Can you tell me what it's all about? Yes. I'm quite older. I'm 65. So you go through life not knowing them. I was the Christmas Easter family mm-hmm. as a kid, and I grew up that way. And so I really never had a relationship. And then as I grew up, I finally got to know that he was there and that with me all the time. And he's always with me now. (laughs) Were you writing to any specific group of readers? Did you have a target audience in mind, Elizabeth? Well, I I figured everybody has, you know, maybe this can help everybody. I didn't have a target. If somebody doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, I hope that this helps them too. So I, I guess that's my target. Can you go back and think about that moment, that spark that was lit that made you think, wow, I have to sit down and get started writing this book? Well, the Lord put it on my heart to write this book, and I'm not a writer. Mm. (laughs) And at first, I wrote a prayer, and I send it to this priest and his caregiver, and I write that in the book how that happened. And I sent them the prayer and thought, oh, he's going to write a book and it'll go in there and everything will be fine. But what you think of what the Lord wants you to do is two different things. Mm. So that didn't happen. So I expanded on that prayer and a book came out of it with God's help. How long of a time frame was that? Did it take a long time for you to write and then get published? Yes, because like I said, I'm not a writer. It took like seven to eight years. Mm. But something would always bring me back to it. I would write a little bit more of it. And finally, I'm amazed that it is completed. (laughs) And, you know, with God's help, everything. Anybody that wants to write, you just got to keep at it, and it'll come to fruition. I have to imagine the day that your first copy came in, Elizabeth, and you got to hold that book in your hands and look at the cover with your name on it and everything. That had to be quite a day. What was that moment like for you? Yes. Like my daughter always tells me, what are you trying to tell me? You know, because I have it in my mind, but I have a hard time telling you, you know, what I want to say. So when I saw this book and even she said, oh, my, I was amazed how my family was amazed. And I was just amazed also that the Lord blessed me to put a book out for him. And it came to be. <laughs> Do you think we'll see more books from you in the future? Right now, this is it for me. Hmm. But you never know. God has a mind. <laughs> Elizabeth, what would you say was the most challenging part of the whole process for you? Was it the writing of the book or was it something during the publishing process? It's the writing for me. The publishing, I had a good experience with Mm -hmm. them going back and forth. And, you know, you got to keep up with it and see what they, you know, because they have a certain, they write it and I don't know how to say this, but they write it in a certain grammar. Mm. And so what I was trying to convey was not coming out. I would write what I wanted to write, and they were good. And my problem was writing it, you know, because mm-hmm. I would stop and I would write and I would stop and forget about it a little while and then write, come back and read it and start. So mine was writing. Everything else really went good after that mm-hmm. once I finished it. Elizabeth, can you tell me about the cover? You have the most touching photo on there. Can you give me a little background on that? Well, in one of my stories is it when my childhood that. I had asthma as a kid, and I would put my head out the window while I was laying down and trying to get air. And so I asked my granddaughter, this is my little granddaughter, and I said, can you kneel down right there in front of the window? And I took a picture, and I this is like four years ago, this picture. Oh, wow. I wanted to use it, you know, because there's the window, and it's showing, you know, if that was me, that's what I was doing, trying to get air, just any kind of air as a kid. But the Lord blessed me to outgrow it as an adult, and so I, I never had it after. Well, I think a lot of readers will be blessed by the words in this book. It's titled, Jesus, When I Did Not Know You, But You Knew Me, and When We Both Knew Each Other. This is written by Elizabeth Jimenez, and is published by Christian Faith Publishing, and you can get it anywhere. So get on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, or take a walk down the street to your local bookshop. You can get this book there. Elizabeth, it's been wonderful speaking with you here today all about your work. I had a nice time. Oh, thank you so much for letting me answer your questions. I appreciate it. This is a captivating collection of poetry sharing the author's emotions and personality with listeners. 
It's author Jim Forbes' new audiobook, Simple Ways. And Jim is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we're going to talk all about this book. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for calling. Well, it's my pleasure. Jim, can you tell me about this book, Simple Ways? What can readers expect? Well, it was written at various times in my life. It, it, it wasn't written overnight. It's, it's been a long process, and it really is about my emotional life and how I felt at different times in my life. It's kind of a guide for somebody who's having problems and might want to read a more emotional products from someone who's emotionally upset or happy or whatever. Jim, what was it that made you decide to get your poetry published? Well, the reason I wrote it was because there were nights there that, that, you know, long and lonely nights and depression and down on the world, and then the next one might be happy and gay. And so that's the way it was written, and my wife was quite a help in helping me. She said, you should publish this, and we did, and then we're having you do it, too. Mm. Is this your first book, Jim? Have you ever done anything like this before? They're doing a second poetry book now, and besides this poetry, I've, I've had one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got seven other books besides this one. Oh, wow. Are they all poetry, or do you write about different things? No, there's a child book, and then I wrote one history book on the Cattle Empire, and then the rest of them are just fiction. Wow. What would you say is the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author? Well... <laughs> For me, I, I taught school for a long time, mm. and I was just a regular school teacher, and I had no idea, really, that I ever could write. I've had these scribblings that I've done over the years, and then when I did start writing and my books have been successful, it made me feel good because I'm more than just a school teacher. Mm. I mean, you teach 20, 30 years. That's a long time to take care of people's children, and to do something else and be successful is quite rewarding. Now, Jim, this is the audiobook version. What was it like hearing your poetry read as opposed to reading it off the page? I loved it. When it was someone else read it, it sounded much better than when I wrote it and, and read it myself. And does it ever get old, that first copy coming in after you put all that time into writing a book and you actually get to hold this thing and your name's on the cover? What kind of moment is that like for you, Jim? Well, it's delightful. I mean, I, I look at this. I, I mean, my kids and my grandkids and, and other kids are going to have this to read for years. So mm. I think it's great that it worked out like that. I just, I love it. Now, Jim, when you think about the writing and you think about the publishing and the marketing distribution, what would you say is the most challenging part of the process for you? I think probably the most challenging part, <laughs> and this may sound silly, but deciding on the cover of the book it, to me, was quite hard. Yeah, a lot of people don't think about that when they're writing a book. They just concentrate on the words, getting that wording right, and then they say, oh, yeah, we need a cover, too. Right. The cover needs to go with the book. You don't print a Western book and put a 1929 Ford on it, <laughs> on the cover. So, yeah, the covers were quite hard in some cases. That's just the thought process that goes into it. This Simple Ways was pretty hard. I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to say about this. And then I got to thinking about it, and it goes along with my life as it went up and down and up and down. It was really pretty much all hard. And then I don't know a whole lot about electronics. If it hadn't have been for my wife, I couldn't have done hardly any of this. Mm. But she knows how to do computers and everything, and so that's how all this got started. I think a lot of people are going to connect with this poetry on a very deep level, and I encourage people to check this out. It's titled Simple Ways. This is written by Jim Forbes, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So get on Audible or go to the Apple iTunes Store or go to Amazon, and you can find this book. Well, Jim, thanks again for joining me tonight, telling me about your poetry and all of your other work. I had a nice time talking with you. Well, I thank you for calling. Thank you very much. Words to Live By. That's the name of the new book that just hit stores, written by T.R. Robinson. And right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, we're going to talk all about that book. T.R. is sitting right next to me. T.R., welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. 
It's great to have you on. Can you tell me what readers are in store for with Words to Live By? Yes, this book is more than just a Christian-based inspirational book. I really wrote it as a guide to help people seek out, compile, and live life according to their own unique set of words that encourages hope and will leave a legacy that others can follow with a can-do mentality. It's my hope that this book will um, serve as a catalyst for the reader to live a life on purpose, uh, following God's will, and to define their meaning of success and achievement based upon relationships they nurture with others, and to become an overcomer, never give up when faced with the inevitable hurdles, obstacles, and disappointments we all experience in life. Mm. So that's really a summation of what the book's all about. T.R., what was your inspiration for this book? Where'd the idea come from? The idea came from a couple of different places. I was in the uh, middle of writing a book with my mom, compiling stories. Uh, she was a gal from the hills and hollers of West Virginia, a place called Bull Creek, West Virginia. And she had some great, great stories to tell about her life growing up there in Bull Creek. And we were compiling that and putting it together. And unfortunately, in the middle of doing all this, COVID took her. She passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. And so there I sat with, you know, a list of a bunch of stories, some poignant, some funny, most of them funny, because she loved to laugh. And I started thinking, you know what, I could honor her by broadening this book out to be just more than, more than just a compilation of stories. But, you know, I wanted to enlarge the topic to include stories of my life, because I've overcome a number of things and stories about those people who have influenced my life. You know, we have influencers today that are based on clicks on a computer and an internet, and uh, my influencers are people like, you know, Winston Churchill, Davy Crockett, mm. and a number of other people who have had a positive impact on my life. And TR, once that day came and the physical copy came in and you got to hold words to live by for the first time, what kind of a moment was that for you? Well, it was a, it was really a surreal moment for me because it was a culmination of, you know, creating something, taking it from an idea germinated in my mind to a physical reality. My wife and I, when the box came with all the books, we, we laughed for like a half an hour. <laughs> you know, it was joy, pure joy. And a lot of people listening right now are authors who are new to all of this. They're just starting out. TR, have you learned anything along the way that you could pass on to them? Yes. The one thing that I learned was what made the process easier for me is I did my research on publishers that specialized in the genre that I was writing in. Mm. That's number one in terms of submitting your manuscript. I did a lot of research on how to submit manuscripts, what they're looking for, and you know, put together a package to uh, send to my publisher, Covenant Books. What do you think the chances are that we'll be seeing more from you here in the future? Well, I'm in the process. I've just finished another book. I'm very diverse in my interests, and I've written a book on how to buy and sell real estate, residential homes, based on my experience as a realtor. So I've, I've finished that manuscript, and I've, I'm just going to start. I'll be searching publishers on that. And then I'm also writing a science fiction book. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that combines time travel and political intrigue. I have a master's degree in international politics and economics, so I'm kind of applying a future dystopian world that's been taken over by what's called the Unified Community, which was developed or created out of the ruins of the United Nations and an authoritarian government and people traveling back in time to our day to try to stop that from occurring. I think a lot of people are going to love this book. I encourage everybody listening to seek this out. It's titled Words to Live By. It's written by T.R. Robinson. It's published by Covenant Books, and you can find it anywhere. So head over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or take a walk down the street to your local bookshop. You can pick this one up. T.R., it's been really great having you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. 
We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. Or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.